Pretty old. Jesus. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Oh, what's up, everybody? Doing a little Q&A. Haven't done one in a while. Got Dennis the Menace here, chilling with us. So, what I want to go over today. I wanted to go over, so I got up till about 4 p.m. today. First of all, let me check the settings, because I know they're probably fucked up. No, they're good. So I wanted to go over some of the research again on single sets versus multiple sets. So let's see. I'm going to share my screen and, you know, here, you know what? I'm going to copy and paste the link to this study. This is a really good study. And, you know, I talk about the study all the time. So James Fisher, James Steele, and Dave Smith, exercise scientists from the UK, um, oh yeah, for those of you with the, uh, the last class of the VIP, so the reason I've been backed up was, you know, I launched the eight week VIP course and I did not anticipate having to do 10 damn calls a day. <laughs> so, um, I ran out of time to do the two week version. So those of you that signed up for the two week version, guess what? You're getting the eight week version, which, uh, is much more expensive, much more in depth and much more time with me. So due to my inability to do the two week version, well, now you get more, all right, you upgraded. So the class is growing for the eight week mentorship. So if you haven't already gotten an email, if you signed up for the two week version and you haven't, uh, I sent an email asking for all your contact information, uh, first name, last name, email address. The reason is I'm putting you into my website and granting you at granting you access to the eight-week mentorship. So what you're going to get, um, those of you who sign up for the two-week, um, you're going to send me your first name, last name, email address. I put it into my system. It's going to automatically send you some login info. And the eight-week mentorship that um, you're getting, those of you who signed up for the two-week, is two group coaching calls a week with all my students, lasts about two hours a piece. We go over everything. And all the content is dripped out seven days at a time. So there's week one of content, week two of content. This you go over at your own pace. It's video. It's basically this two-week course um, pre-recorded. Also, you're going to get a huge library of exercise demonstrations with voiceover. Also, you're going to get access to the advanced routines, advanced arms. I'm doing advanced shoulders, advanced chest, just some different techniques you could try if your uh, muscle groups are not adapting. So those of you who have signed up for the two-week course, round two, um, be on the lookout for your email because you're going to be in the eight-week course. Much more comprehensive, way better. Uh, the reason I fell behind on the two-week course is because my eight-week course blew up. But it's good. I can take care of all of you. You're going to get a you're going to get a way better course basically. So, my fuck up re results in you getting a better course. Um so, um and Mark, I'll send it to you too. Um okay. All right, so if you want to sign up, book a call with me. There's a link in the description below for this video. Click that, book a call. I'm going to explain to you my eight-week coaching program, 
and um, book a call with me. I'll explain it to you when we can sign you up. So my eight-week coaching program is eight weeks of working with me directly and my other students. We have group calls, stuff like that. Eight weeks of dialing everything in. So at the end of eight weeks, hopefully you'll be an expert. You should be an expert at the end of eight weeks. So if you guys are, if you're confused, not even if you're confused, if you're not seeing the results that you want, something's wrong. All right. Not that we could all turn into bodybuilders, but we can all get significantly in better shape. And if you're not, you're doing something wrong. So if you sign up for my eight week coaching, you work with me for eight weeks. We're going to figure it out together. <clears throat> so, um, all right, you know, I'm just going to answer some questions. Maybe we'll get into the research. Maybe we won't. We'll see. Um, all right, let's see. I'll just ask your question. Ask your questions. See, the thing is, my eight-week coaching program is like this. For two hours, we sit and we have um, I answer questions. But the difference is it's in person. It's all in a Zoom. It's all in a Zoom call. And they're all recorded. So you can watch them. As, as much as you want. Um, but you're all on a Zoom call, so we're talking in person, not any of this texting bullshit. Much easier. So, okay, if you're unable to reach one set to failure during my workout, can I do two sets to reach failure? Yes, duh, of course. But I, I say this all the time. You can achieve optimal results with one set to failure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are. You may not re be reaching failure. You may be reaching a sticking point and perceiving that as failure. So and this is what I tell my students. If you get to the, if you get to, if you get stuck and you stop the exercise and you feel like you have more in the tank, do another set. All right. There's nothing wrong with doing another set. Uh, doing another set results in overtraining when you're actually reaching failure and you're crushing it. But if you, if you get done with the exercise and you're like, man, I, I don't feel like I got it, do another. Because you probably didn't. Two sets, two sets is not a bad thing. I mean, unless you get to, you know, my level, then two sets is like the worst thing you could do once you're able to inroad very deeply. And I got off the phone with a guy a couple days ago. And, you know, this guy, he's only doing a handful of exercises. He's, he was digging so deep that I told him, dude, you got to back off. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, he was actually doing too much. He was only doing one set. So in some cases this happens, but for most of you, two sets is not going to be a bad thing. It's just not going to be any better. But if you're unsure, just have another one. Is hitting each body part twice a week beneficial? Depends. Depends how hard are you training? If you are able to tolerate Hitting each body part twice a week, it might be beneficial. But if that second workout you feel like you're dragging ass, you don't have any strength and you feel dead, then that's becoming counterproductive. So what well, actually let's look at let's look at the research. What does it say about frequency? So remember this study, I love this study, because they, they, these are the only guys who literally looked at all of the research on muscle growth and compared it all. This is what they found. So look, this is all the studies they looked at. Look at this. Look at all these. They looked at all of them. So what did they find? After James Fisher and James Steele and Dave Smith looked at all of the peer-reviewed research on muscle growth, what did they find when it comes to how many times you should train per week? Well, let's see. So I put the link to this study in the, uh, in the comments. Read it. If you guys are confused, if you go, if you read the study and you go through all the research, you're probably not going to, well, it's a little tough to comprehend if you don't really understand exercise physiology, but so volume of frequency, what did they find in terms of frequency? So the question is, what is the question? Is hitting each body part twice a week beneficial? Well, let's look at the research. What did they say? Frequency of training should be self-selected as there appears no evidence which can support any recommendation. What does that mean? That means there seems to be, according to the evidence, there seems to be no difference between working out once a week, twice a week, three times a week, considering 
you're actually working hard. If you're training like most people do, like shit, and I was just in the gym, just people moving things around, thinking they're working out. If you're doing that, then yeah, you probably got to do a lot more. But if you're training properly, seems to be no difference between one workout a week, two workouts a week, and three week workouts a week. Why? Think of it this way. I just came up with this this week. There's only so much your muscle can grow in a week. Think about it. There's only so much a plant can grow in a week. So when you're trying to grow a plant, think about it. You can give it the optimal amount of water, the optimal amount of sunlight, and that plant will grow as fast and as big as it is capable of growing. Giving the plant more sunlight and more water doesn't make the plant grow any faster. It doesn't make the plant grow any bigger. Your body's the same way. If you stimulate your body in one workout, and that's optimal for the, the optimal amount of muscle your body can grow in seven days, then doing another workout isn't going to make it grow any more or any faster. Just like excessively watering a plant. It's the same thing, guys. You need to remember, this is not under your control. Muscle growth isn't under your control. You can't force muscle growth. You can only stimulate it and give it the optimal environment. So to answer your question, you know, if you're training properly, is twice a week beneficial? Probably not. Beneficial how, though? Is it beneficial in terms of muscle growth? If you're training properly, nah. Is it beneficial psychologically? Well, if you like going to the gym, yeah. So, I mean, if you could tolerate training twice a week and adapt and respond, and you prefer to go to the gym more often, go for it. But if you're short on time, don't be afraid you're not optimizing your gains training once a week because you are. Thank you for the testimonial. This is an individual that was in my first two-week uh, mentorship class. Um, yeah, and um, this is Mark, and we went through a lot. So, Mark, I'm going to give you access to the eight-week course, too, uh, as a gift for joining my two-week course. You're going to learn even more. Oh, here's Ricky. Had a call with Ricky earlier this week, signed up for the mentorship. Um, got a group call tomorrow at noon, Ricky, tomorrow at noon. Can you talk about increasing physical work capacity, training super intensely? And frequently is understood that it is the most effective. Um, work capacity, physical work capacity in terms of exercise is fucking irrelevant. That's the thing. It, it's irrelevant. Completely, completely, completely irrelevant. Irrelevant. There are some people who, who like, you know, they, they train for power based on, you know, the physics of power. They train for work capacity and work based on the physics of work. Dude, this shit does not apply to the human body. All right. It doesn't. You know, what is work capacity? <laughs> when is the video about Kino body going on? I'm not doing a video about Kino body. Basically, what happened was, you know, I'm working with a marketing team that is Kino body good. All right. So we may be, we, we may wonder, like, why is Kino body all over the fucking place? And his programs are trash. They're so fucking stupid. Um, why is he all over the place? Well, real good marketing. So I got myself a marketing team, except the difference is I'm providing a good product. And my goal is to push Kino body out of the fitness space. Why? Cause he's a clown. The dude drives a fucking Lamborghini around. He has, he doesn't know his ass from his elbow when it comes to exercise. So he's done. He's just part of my little goal. I want to push all the douchebags out of the fitness industry. I heard someone say that continually stressing the body and central nervous system would cause their body to become accustomed to doing more and their central nervous system can then tolerate more. No, no. The amount of physical stress your body can tolerate is based on strength. The more strength your body has, the more capacity in reserve it has. 
Therefore, the more it can tolerate. The whole point of that, that's the whole point of training is increasing its ability to tolerate more. Your body doesn't do this from work capacity. It does this from strength. For instance, um, you know, say you could only lift a 50 pound barbell 10 times, couldn't do the 11th. And then you get to the point where you could lift a 100 pound barbell 10 times, can't get the 11th. Well, your work capacity for that 50 pounds doubled. Strength, right? What's so confusing about this? Can increasing androgen receptors stimulate muscle growth? Um, yeah. Well, to a degree. I mean, that's kind of what steroids do, I think. I, I don't think there's any way you can like naturally increase androgen. Well, uh, uh, to to a degree, you know. Uh, you know, eh, that's tough to say. Tough to say. My pleasure, Luke. Thank, thank you for the question. Appreciate. I always appreciate the good questions. How important is it sleep? Sleep is extremely important. Very, 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 very important. My snake is sleeping on my hand. Um, extremely important because sleep is when your body regulates all the hormones. Sleep is where your body does a lot of the muscle repair. Um, a lot of the um, the repair from inflammation and micro trauma. If you are not sleeping well, your your gains are going to suck. Like no, I I noticed if I get a couple bad nights of sleep, I, I feel myself deflate bad. And then when I get good sleep, I feel like amazing. Let's see. I honestly couldn't do multiple sets after one of my sets. Wouldn't be able to do three, four of my reps. Yeah, exactly. Because you're doing them right. You know, that's the thing. I mean, if you're not, like, doing them right, you know, you could probably do more. But what are your thoughts on obesity officially being classed as a disease? I think that is the typical narrative of uh, Western culture trying to remove personal responsibility for from everybody's misfortunes. Here's a little tip, guys. The sooner you can accept personal responsibility for your actions – the sooner your life will become amazing. All right. Um, and that's fat people. You know, I've noticed the, you know, I've, I've been doing these, you know, uh, free coaching calls, right? Well, they're not free coaching calls, but these calls, right? And I get some people who were around 300 pounds, all right? Every person I've had, that was around 300 pounds after talking with them on a call and explaining to them how I can help them and change their damn life. They will not accept my help. I've noticed this commonality among people who are extremely obese. Now, what does that tell me? Does that tell me they have a particular disease? No. It tells me they have a particular set of character traits, mostly laziness. You know, obese people, you could, you could, here's the thing. And, and this is what I noticed. I've had, I've, I've had guys that I'm on the phone with them. They're 300 freaking pounds. And I'm like, okay, this is how you do it. I can help you. Let's change it. Well, I don't know. This is only with the 300 pound people. Why? Laziness. Lack of character. Pathetic. So obesity, obesity is not a disease. Obesity is a fucking choice. And it's a choice made by lazy people with a victim mindset. Um, if, if with with obese people, especially like these, you know, guys who are 300 pounds I was talking to. I can literally give them a magic pill, put it in front of them on the counter. They could take it and lose 100 pounds. I bet that they wouldn't even have the discipline to swallow the pill. That's how fucking bad they are. So the super obese people are looking for a magic pill. If you came up with a magic pill, they'd be too lazy to take it. It's insane. But again, I mean, you know, there's 7, 8 billion people on this planet. There are going to be some people who are so fucked up in the head that even if you – Show them the exact way to change their body. They won't do it. 
I don't understand. You probably don't understand. Who knows? Let's see. If you feel well rested from sleep, are you basically getting enough? Yep. I naturally can't sleep more than six hours, six and a half hours, something. Yeah. Everybody has different requirements. The older you get, the less you need. I need, when I hit seven hours, I'm good to go. Seven, seven and a half. Yeah. That's, that's how you know how much sleep you need. See how much, how many hours it takes to feel well rested. And there's specific vitamins for helping people with high blood pressure besides over the counter medicine. No, um, just exercise, you know, increasing cardiac output, stressing your cardiovascular system, increasing coronary blood flow, increasing stroke volume that helps with blood pressure. Let's see. Sure, you will agree that one set to failure, 100% units of intensity, is all a practice of mental focus more than physical. Yeah. Well, it's just that. It's practice. You have to practice. I mean, you got to practice pushing your body to that point. Some people can do it. Some people really can't push the body that hard. And I have techniques of working around that. There, you know, I've trained over 20,000 sessions. There are some people who just can't go that far, no matter the instruction. And there are methods to work around that. Do you do any direct work for your traps? No, I do not. Um, the trapezius, a function of them is scapular retraction, like pulling your shoulders back. A pull down in a row does that. Sure, you could do shoulder elevation, which is another function of your traps, um, but I don't really do them. And again, the reason I don't do them is because my traps have always developed easily. You know, People tend to not really do exercises um, that develop, you know, the or people tend to do less exercises for the muscle groups that develop more easily. Again, guys, if you're stuck in your training, if you're not seeing the results you you want, I can save you a heck of a lot of time if you join my eight eight week coaching program. You'll learn everything. Um. You know, lots of people spend so much time like, and, and here's the other thing too, guys. Um, here's another thing. The exercises in the workout, AKA the list of exercises has very little to do with your results. You know, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's a good workout? It's not the workout. It's not the exercises. It's not the order of the exercises. It's not the machine. It's the way you perform the exercise. Is That's what's important. That's not the exercise. A bench press, a chest press, and a pack of fly. Your, your chest is going to grow the exact same regardless of what you use. It's how you perform them. Um, is there anything training wise you can do to increase fat loss? Not talking about eating, sleeping, and hydrating. Yeah, lift weights. Training wise, that's all you can do. I mean, there's, there's, there isn't a way to perform your training that's going to increase fat loss. Do you want to know why? Your body doesn't burn fat during exercise, it burns glucose, it doesn't burn fat. Your body burns fat during physical activity as a last fucking resort. When you're about to die. So consider, th think about if you're like stranded in the desert and you're just trying to survive. You know how you would feel, right? Completely worn out. Like no energy. That's when your body's burning fat. And do any of you feel that on a daily basis? No. Are any of you going through your day feeling like you could barely move and just trying to survive? No. You're not burning fat. Do you ever feel like that during an ex a workout? No. You're not burning fat. You're burning glucose, dude. So there's there's nothing. No, your body's going to burn glucose. If you're low on glucose, your body's going to convert other substrate into glucose. And it's going to burn some fat. Um, but your workouts are going to suck. That's why when you're low on glucose and you're in a deficit, your workouts suck. You know, if your performance is significantly reduced and your workouts feel horrible, then you're probably burning more fat but you're not burning much anyway.
How bad is high fructose corn syrup and soda? Um, well, I mean, it's bad for insulin, but it's mostly because of the sugar, dude. I mean, soda is bad because it has 300 fucking calories in a bottle. I mean, Gatorade's bad, like this shit. I drink this after a workout because I want the calories and I want the sugar to put back into my body so I don't feel like trash. But again, my goal is not fat loss. You know, 140 calories in this, 35 grams of sugar, probably not a good idea. Um, what's a bottle of soda have? 280? It's, you know, it's not so much the high fructose corn syrup, it's, it's the calories. Do you think you can lose fat in a surplus if you keep your fit? No. <laughs> Did you hear that? You can't lose fat in a surplus. No. How is that? That's, that? That defies the laws of thermodynamics. If you keep fats below 20 grams a day, dude, dietary fat has nothing to do with fat gain or fat loss. It comes down to calories. Man, I wonder where you heard that. That is like so far off. That's in the weeds, dude. That is like not even close. How on earth could you possibly lose fat in a surplus? Dude, that physiologically, that makes no sense. And it never can make sense. All right. Uh, I know you explained this before, but can you briefly explain passive and active insufficiency? Well, I don't, I'm sorry, buddy. I don't want to wake you up. Um Active insufficiency is when your muscle is so contracted that the actin filaments kind of bunch up on top of each other and they get in each other's way and they can't grab and shorten anymore. So when you feel this cramping position, that's active insufficiency. All right. And it's normally when it crosses two joints. Passive insufficiency is a stretch, is a stretched position. That's all. It's super easy. Passive insufficiency is when you feel a stretch. The reason you're insufficient in these positions is because of the overlap between the actin filaments, the actin heads, and the, the thick myosin filament. Um, so I'll show you. That is not the one I wanted. Hold on. Good luck. Okay. So this is active insufficiency. So active insufficiency, see these heads? Active insufficiency is when all of this gets so bunched up that these heads cannot like the, these are too close to each other and the heads have nowhere to grab and pull in so that happens when you completely shorten a mus muscle active ins insufficiency is just the opposite when there's so little actin and myosin overlap there's so little overlap between the uh, myosin head and the actin that you can't produce a good contraction and this is because it's just so fully lengthened so um you know, there's this belief that training the muscle and active and passive insufficiency could help it from a tension standpoint, um, stimulate mechanosensors better for more growth. I'm very on the fence about it. I'm leaning towards no, but I'm but I've been trying it anyway. So I've been trying to work the biceps in passive insufficiency as an experiment. Intuitively, I don't think it'll make a difference, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, I've also been working the biceps in active insufficiency. Just trying it. So far, so far, no. So far, I think it's nonsense. But here's the thing. That's for an advanced trainee. If you are 
not advanced and you have a hard time training your muscles hard, working a muscle in passive insufficiency and active insufficiency may help you generate more stress in the muscle. For someone who knows how to generate stress in the muscle, it's not going to do anything for me. It hasn't. But if your arms are not growing very well, it might help. It might. Do I guarantee it will? No. Could it? It could. Mm. What's the purpose of a bulk? To get fat. That's the only purpose of a bulk. Do not fucking bulk. It's ridiculous. There's this guy, Durian Ryder, claiming that he's popular in the YouTube fitness community. Well, if he's popular in the YouTube fitness community, it means he's a fucking retard. These people, uh, these people are absolutely clueless. That's the dumbest fucking shit I've ever heard in my life. Lose fat in a surplus. What? What the fuck? That that makes so little sense. That's ridiculous. What do you think about? All right, let's see. What do you think about pausing and squeezing the muscle for about two seconds during the concentric phase, somewhere in the middle of range of motion? If it's a flexion exercise where you're shortening the joint angle, like a curl, what do I think about it? Go for it. Um, it might help you maintain more tension on the muscle. Is pausing and squeezing going to result in more growth? Eh, probably not. Um, pausing and squeezing the muscle for two seconds somewhere in the country, during the concern, somewhere in the middle of the range of motion. You can't pause and squeeze in the middle of the range of motion. It doesn't make any sense. You can pause and squeeze in the contracted position, but how are you going to pause and squeeze? I don't know. You're overthinking it. <laughs> it's not going to make a difference. Any tips from recovering from lower back pain? Yes, do a lumbar extension exercise. Simple. Or a stiff legged deadlift with light weight and preferably a trap bar. Andrew Tate. Uh, yeah, Andrew Tate's fucking hilarious. Um, any more YouTube channels recommend? I recommend John Sanma's Bulldog Mindset. I don't know. It's a good friend of mine. He's a cool dude. Bulldog. Mindset. Definitely recommend that YouTube channel. I got about 15 minutes left, guys, until I do some more some of my calls. So again, if you guys are stuck in your training, you're not seeing the results you want, you're doing something wrong. You might be following my recommendations, but you probably are not applying them correctly if you have not seen significant changes okay so if this sounds like you click the link in the description book a free call with me and i'll introduce you to my eight week coaching uh mentorship you work directly with me for eight weeks there's two group coaching calls every week two hours per call plus access to a ton of video content teaching you everything you need to know the physiology of muscle growth the physiology of fat loss, biomechanics, moment arms, diet, nutrition, um, advanced techniques, to, you, how to design a workout, how to track your workouts, everything. In my eight-week coaching plan, you'll learn, or you'll learn everything. Do you think using a resistance band for bent over rows is worth it, or is that too ineffective? I mean, if it places tension on your muscle, it'll help them grow. It's just really dumb way of doing it. Um, do you mean resistance band with a bar or just resistance bands? The problem, the, the problem, with do, why would you do that? Because the thing is <laughs> a resistance band with a row. So the problem with the barbell row is that you're getting the same amount of resistance and you're, you're getting too much resistance in the contracted position due to gravity. That's the problem with the barbell row. Adding resistance band gives you even more resistance in the contracted position, which amplifies the fucking problem with the barbell row to begin with. It's the worst thing you could do is add a resistance band to a barbell row because you're, you're exacerbating the problem with the barbell row. You're making it worse. Hell no. If I do another set after a few minutes of rest, does that mean I'm not training hard enough? No. 
you could probably do another set. It's like, how well can you perform a set? If you do a set of 12 to failure and you wait a few minutes, you could do another set of 12 to failure. No, you didn't train hard enough. If you do no, if you do a set of 12 to failure, you wait a few minutes, you can only do six with the same weight. Then you train hard enough. Why do gymnasts have big arms despite training every day? Genetics. Why are basketball players tall? That's basically what you just asked me. This is called selection bias. Particular genetics gravitate towards particular activities. Gymnasts have a particular set of genetics. Relatively lighter. My snake just yawned. Freaked me out. Uh, particularly smaller bodies, big, strong muscles. Gymnastics doesn't make a gymnast look the way they do. Gymnasts look the way they do because they have sick genetics that are good for gymnastics. But playing basketball doesn't make you tall. Tall people play basketball. Same thing. Gymnasts have big arms despite training every day. Exactly. Their genetics are so particular that they have big arms in spite of training every day. I mean, just a looped resistance pin. It would work. You're probably better off doing a time static contraction with it instead of range of motion. Wait, don't you think a barbell row is a good exercise? It's a fine exercise. It's not the best, but there is a problem with it. The problem with the barbell row is you get too much resistance in the contracted position. Does this mean it will prevent your muscles from growing? No. But is it less efficient yes it's not a bad exercise but it's not the best option the best option would be something that reduces the amount of resistance in the contracted position is it going to make a difference in the long run in terms of muscle growth no but it's a little less efficient Would you recommend Mike Mentor's HIP program? No, I recommend mine. Mike Mentor, that was 30 years ago. He got a lot of things wrong. He was on the right track, but he got a lot of things wrong. <clears throat> there is a rumor that 80% of MMA fights are on steroids. you agree with that? Probably. Um, I would say 80% of professional athletes are on steroids. You want to why? It's entertainment. They want to entertain you. I think the NFL gives a shit if their players are on steroids. No, they want people to watch. All right, let's see. Jason Wittrock did a 21-day, 4,000-calorie-day keto challenge, did bipod test on day 120. Results were mind-blowing. Maybe do a video about it. Dude, I don't do keto. Keto's fucking stupid. I'm not wasting my time doing a video. I, yeah, I take calls for 8 to 10 hours a day. I'm not wasting my time doing a fucking video on one guy who did good on keto. Ridiculous. How many exercises a week do you recommend? Depends. Join my coaching program. Dude, this shit depends. I don't recommend any. I recommend what works for you. That's the thing. There is no, there's no basic recommendation. Um, how much Advil do you recommend to get rid of your headache? Exactly. Depends on you. Some people may only need 100 milligrams of Advil. Some people may need 600. Depends. So how many exercises do I recommend per week? For mu per muscle, well, how much Advil do you recommend to get rid of a headache? Same answer. Depends. Uh, do you think pike push-ups can be a good substitute for the overhead press? No, it's not a good substitute. Um, it can be useful if, there, if you don't have access to an overhead press, but I would never substitute a fucking pike push-up for an overhead press. Hell no. Absolutely not. Anyway. Does resting less than one minute between sets of the same exercise gravitate more towards endurance and hypertrophy? No. No. Here we go. Let's bring up the evidence. Ugh. What do you mean endurance? What's endurance? So, Scary Hill House, comment. What is endurance? Then we can figure this out. Tell me what you think endurance is. Hmm. <laughs> Got you thinking now, huh? Bet you don't know. 
What is endurance? While you do that, I'm going to look through rest intervals. Oh, would you look at that? Length of rest between sets and or exercises appears to have no significant effect on hypertrophic gain. Studies 74 and 83. Let's look up 74, 83. Comparison between constant and decreasing rest intervals. Let's see. We'll figure it out together. There has been research on this. You guys think I make this shit up? No, I read this shit. You want to go relatively quickly between exercises just for the overall stress, the overall demand on your body. All right, let's see. Let me uh, try to stop sharing. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. Okay. All right. More resistance training programs use constant rest period lengths between sets and exercises, but some programs you de use decreasing rest period lengths. All right. Well, I'm guessing what that means is, uh, say, all right. So the aim of the study was to compare the effect on strength and hypertrophy of eight weeks of resistance training using constant rest intervals, meaning we'll say three minutes between each set, no matter what, and decreasing rest intervals, moving faster between sets and exercises. All right. Three sets, 12 repetitions with two minute rest intervals between sets and exercises were performed by both groups. During the next six weeks of training, CI group trained using two minutes between sets and the decreasing interval group trained with decreasing intervals, two minutes, decreasing to 30 seconds as the six weeks of training progressed. So they start off with two minutes, and then each week they took less time in between sets. The first group just took two minutes in between sets. So what's the conclusion? In conclusion, the results indicate training protocol with decreasing intervals, meaning shorter breaks between sets, is just as effective as taking two minutes in between sets all the time over short training periods for AOE for increasing maximal strength and muscle cross-sectional area. So, same. Favorite bodybuilder of all time, Mike Menser. My favorite physique of all time was Robbie Robinson. Looked fucking sick. All right. So exactly. So my point wasn't to like, you know, shit on you by asking you what is endurance. My point is we need to learn the definitions of endurance. You know, does, you know, resting less between sets increase endurance? This is just some shit that we hear in the fitness industry. But no, but most people can't even define endurance. Uh, the short answer to your question is no. If you want to learn all the science behind this and understand this, Book a free call with me and join my eight-week mentorship. I'll clear all this up for you. <sighs> all right. Have you ever tracked your heart rate during HIIT workouts? Yeah. My, it gets up to like 170 when I do a squat or a leg, leg press. Actually, I could check right now if Dennis the Menace will let me. Let me see. All right, so I just did a workout a little while ago, and my heart rate got up to 152. Dennis, hold on, Dennis is, Dennis is moving my watch. Um, all right, yeah, so it got up, the peak, my workout about an hour ago, got up to 152, and it looks like it stayed between 130 and 150. So it seems that's where it's going. And my resting heart rate is about 54, 52. Why do you think some so-called coaches say there's a difference between endurance and hypertrophy? Because they're fucking stupid. <laughs> That's the only reason. You got to remember, just because someone's a coach doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. They, they usually don't. My day is going great. 
taken away. Making things happen. So, you know, here's, you know, I, I want to do some, you know, we do this during my coaching calls in my, uh, in uh, my coaching program. We go over the research like this. We look at it. We look what it says. You know? <clears throat> All right, Lone Wolf. All right, say I'm happy with the size and the muscle. How would I maintain it with hit? Train very infrequently. You could probably maintain your size and your muscle once once a week, once every two weeks, probably once every three weeks of training, probably maintain your muscle. Um, and here's, I'll show you. All right, so let's look at, um, I just did a video on this, the training and detraining. All right, detraining, not deloading. Deloading is fucking stupid. Deloading is when you, in some retard on my uh, YouTube, I have to block him now. He's just being annoying. Before I used to play with him and like, you know, tell him to shut the fuck up, whatever. But now I got to block him because he's just being annoying. So I don't recommend deloading. He goes, well, didn't you just say you don't recommend deloading and now you're saying you do? No, you fucking retard. I don't recommend deloading. I do recommend detraining. What's the difference? Deloading. Taking a week where you don't train your body very hard, but you still train. You're still doing sets and reps. You're just not doing them hard. Stupid. Fucking stupid. What's the point of going to the gym if you're not going to train your body hard? Dumb. Detraining. Taking time off from the gym completely. I recommend that. Don't recommend deloading because it's fucking retarded. I recommend detraining. Because if you're at a point where you're just, you're not seeing anything, you're probably overtraining. If you're considering you're actually training hard, which if you're not really seeing any results, chances are you're just not training hard. Um, but um, detraining Taking a week, two weeks off, let your body catch up. Repair. So untrained persons uh, appear to make hypertrophic gains around three weeks. All right. Brief around three weeks absences from training appear not to cause significant atrophy, a.k.a. muscle loss, and potentially promote greater hypertrophy upon returning. Why? Because usually you're giving your body a chance to catch up. Okay. Recruiting all muscle fibers through going to failure with only one set is the way because once you stimulate the hard twitch, it's called fast twitch. Once you stimulate the fast twitch fibers, you cannot use them until they're recovered. You can, you may be able to recruit them, but you cannot stimulate them any better. Simply deep. Yeah, my content's mostly fitness. Sometimes we go off, but it's 99% fitness. Thank you. All right. Are, are there actual real good protein shakes, or is that just marketing gayness? Yes, marketing gayness. Marketing bullshit. Um, I like Optimum Nutrition. I think it tastes the best. <laughs> just got a finger monkey. What's a finger monkey? Is that a type of snake? This is a python. This is a ball python. His name is Dennis. He's a good boy. He's a very good boy. And just like people, you know, snakes need to crawl around. Snakes need snakes need exercise too. So Dennis comes out sometimes and we, you know, we hang out. Just play, just just roll around a little bit. <clears throat> You're a good buddy. Is a couple of seconds of pushing hard and breathing, but being stuck in a rep with zero movement, the standard for failure. That's that's a good way to know that you're reaching failure. Um, if you get stuck and then continue to push until you feel like your muscles die out, I recommend most of you do that. Thank you for everything. Big fan from Turkey. Anything you want to find, you can find in Turkey. Anything you want to find. That's from the movie uh, uh, Taken. That movie's sick. Where he goes to Turkey and he kills everybody to find his wife. 
Uh, oh, yeah. I'm willing to bet the name you blo guy blocked was James Bing. Yeah, this guy, James Bing, you know, I, I feel bad for him. He obviously hates himself because, I mean, if, if you're really going to, like, wait to comment on someone's video, oh, my God, the poor guy. You got to realize the psychology behind YouTube trolls. They're people who generally – they generally don't have lives because, I mean, if you did, you wouldn't be trolling on YouTube. Um, they generally don't like themselves. They're generally pretty nerdy, kind of losers. So I kind of, you know, I feel bad for him. He's just, just fucked up. He's a fucked up guy. But I would play with him. You know, he would leave something stupid. I would say, oh, <laughs> you're just mad because all the women reject you or something like that. Just, you know. Just play with him. And then he just, then he started like trying to push potential clients away from me. That's fucked up, dude. If you're going to a YouTube channel and you're trying to mess with somebody's business, man, you're a, you're, you're a bitch. You're a huge bitch. And, you know, he would say, oh, I'm trying to you know, save people from getting scammed. No, you're not. You just hate your life because you're a broke, fat bitch. You're not trying to save people. It's not for them. So after I was fucking with him, I, I decided to just, Keep blocking them. I, mean, I don't need that shit. I don't want some douchebag just. And he kept creating different accounts. I blocked him three times. He created a new. <laughs> this fucking guy created a new email and a new YouTube account just to comment on my video. Guys, I got 7,000 subscribers. Like, what's he doing? Poor son of a bitch. Oh, my God. I would love. If he comes back, I want to. Uh. I would love to have him on a live stream, make him, I, I guarantee he's way too much of a coward to show his face. All right. And if he doesn't show his face, anyway, I want to, I want to, um, I want to invite him to a debate, a video debate, make him show his face. But we know he's too much of a coward to show his face because he's a pussy. Um, but if he did, boy, would that be funny. Boy, would that be funny. I wouldn't I wouldn't make fun of him. I would just expose him a little. Finger monkeys are called... Whoa, I don't know what that is. Just small monkeys you can hold on your hand. Get out of here. That's fucking awesome, dude. You can own small monkeys? Wow, that's sick. Finger monkeys. Get out of here. Where the hell are you from? You can do this in the United States? So what kinds of conversations do you have with your chap besides fitness stuff? I don't know. Things about finger monkeys, I guess. Uh-oh. All right, guys. I have to uh, get on a call right now. Um, if you guys would like to book a call with me, click the link in the description. Oh, you up here in Florida, bro? Really, dude? Um, I'm in Florida. I'm in Tampa. Sick. Um, all right. So I got to hop on a call. Uh how scary would a chimpanzee be without myostatin? Oh, my God. We <laughs> probably need the National Guard. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I got to get on a call. So if you guys want to book a call with me, join my eight-week coaching program. Learn everything. Learn everything, all right, instead of waiting for these to come up every two weeks. Uh, book the link in the description below. We'll chat. You can meet my snake. This snake. This one. <laughs> all right. We'll see you guys later.